So the, the question that Closure Compiler is answering is how do you build a large JavaScript app, especially in 2004? Facebook made a system called Flow. Google has a system called Closure Compiler that is confusingly unrelated to the Closure language with a J. And Closure uses Closure Compiler. So just much like Flow and TypeScript, it is a thing where you put JS doc annotations and it type checks your code. In the chaotic and lawless landscape of the early 21st century internet, a quiet crisis was forming within the walls of the world's most ambitious technology companies. The web browser, originally designed to display static documents, was being twisted into a platform for complex applications. JavaScript, the language of this new frontier, was a tool of loose morals and fragile structures. It was a scripting language built in 10 days by Brendan Eich, intended for small interactions and minor visual flair. Yet, by the year 2004 and 2005, engineers at Google were attempting the impossible. They were building Gmail and Google Maps, applications that required not hundreds, but hundreds of thousands of lines of code to function. In this environment, every variable was a liability, and every byte of data sent over the network was a tax on the user's patience. The chaos of JavaScript threatened to collapse these massive engineering efforts under their own weight. To conquer this chaos, Google did not simply write better code. They fundamentally altered the nature of the terrain. They created a weapon that would impose strict order upon the anarchy of the web. This tool was the Closure Compiler. It was released to the public in 2009, but it had already been the secret engine driving Google's dominance for years. The Closure Compiler was not merely a minifier, a tool that shrinks code by removing white space. It was a true compiler for a language that was never meant to be compiled. It treated JavaScript not as a final product, but as a raw material to be analyzed, dismantled, and reconstructed into a form that was leaner, faster, and ruthlessly efficient. The premise of the Closure Compiler was simple but aggressive. It posited that the code a human writes is for humans, and the code a machine executes should be for machines. There should be no resemblance between the two. When an engineer wrote a long, descriptive variable name to ensure clarity for their team, the compiler saw only waste. In its most potent mode, known as advanced optimizations, the software would rename a variable from a 40-character string to a single letter. It did this not just for local variables, which was common practice, but for properties across the entire global scope of the application. This required a level of insight into the code that bordered on omniscience. The compiler had to know with absolute certainty that the property, named user settings, in one module was the exact same reference as user settings in a module loaded three seconds later. If it made a mistake, the code would break instantly. This necessity for certainty birthed the parallel universe of type safety long before the world had heard of TypeScript. To survive the aggressive rewriting of the Closure Compiler, developers had to annotate their code with extreme precision. They used JSDoc, a system of comments that existed above the code, invisible to the browser but glaringly obvious to the compiler. A developer would write a comment declaring that a specific function accepted only a string and returned a number. The Closure Compiler would read this comment and enforce it as law. If the developer tried to pass an integer where a string was expected, the compilation would fail. This was the other type system at Google, a rigorous, tyrannical enforcement mechanism that turned the loose, dynamic nature of JavaScript into a rigid structure of iron and concrete. The impact of this technology on the economics of the web cannot be overstated. In the mid-2000s, internet speeds were a fraction of what they are today. Latency was the enemy of revenue. Amazon had famously calculated that a delay of just 100 milliseconds cost them 1% in sales. Google, whose business model depended on keeping users inside their ecosystem of search, mail, and maps, understood this visceral reality. By crushing the size of their JavaScript bundles, often reducing them by 50 or 60%, the Closure Compiler saved terabytes of bandwidth daily. This efficiency did not just save money on server costs, it saved the user's time, making the web feel instantaneous. It allowed Google to deliver desktop class experiences inside a browser window, creating a competitive moat that rivals found nearly impossible to cross. However, this power came with a heavy cost, creating a divide in the engineering world that persists to this day. The Closure Compiler was notoriously difficult to use. It demanded that developers surrender their freedom to write dynamic, clever code. 
In standard JavaScript, one might access a property using a string, allowing for flexible programming patterns. The Clojure compiler viewed this as heresy. Because it renamed properties to single letters to save space, accessing a property by its original string name would result in a crash. The property settings no longer existed. It was now A. Any code that looked for settings was looking for a ghost. This forced engineers to write code in a specific, rigid style that many found suffocating. It was a trade-off of expression for domination. While Google was fortifying its castle with closure, a rival power was growing in the Pacific Northwest. Microsoft, led by the legendary language designer Anders Helsberg, the creator of Turbo Pascal and C Sharp, saw the same problem of JavaScript chaos, but approached it with a different philosophy. In 2012, Microsoft released TypeScript. Where Clojure was authoritarian and focused on the machine, TypeScript was diplomatic and focused on the human. TypeScript provided a type system that felt like a helpful assistant rather than a harsh disciplinarian. It did not try to aggressively rewrite the code or mangle property names to save the last byte. It simply wanted to make writing large-scale applications safer and more pleasant. The contrast between these two systems reveals a fundamental divergence in strategy. The Clojure compiler was born from an infrastructure-first mindset. It prioritized the runtime performance and the file size above all else. It was an engineering solution to a bandwidth problem. TypeScript was born from a developer experience mindset. It prioritized the ease of writing and reading code. For years, these two ideologies coexisted but rarely touched. Google continued to rely on Clojure for its flagship products, building a massive internal library known as the Clojure Library, which provided the building blocks for Gmail and Docs. This library was optimized specifically to feed the compiler, creating a closed loop of efficiency that outside developers found difficult to penetrate. The controversy surrounding Clojure was often quiet, buried in the issue trackers and mailing lists of the open source world. Yet, it represented a significant philosophical struggle. Critics argued that Clojure was not truly open source in spirit because it was so tailored to Google's internal infrastructure that it was useless to the average developer. It was a tool built by giants for giants. While libraries like jQuery dominated the popular consciousness, becoming the de facto standard for web development in the late 2000s, Clojure remained the tool of the heavy industry. It was used by sophisticated engineering teams who faced the same scale problems as Google. But for the hobbyist or the startup, the learning curve was a vertical wall. This friction became even more apparent as the JavaScript community began to standardize. New tools appeared, such as Webpack and Babel, which offered modularity and transpilation without the brutal constraints of closure. The community moved toward a model where code was transformed for compatibility, not aggressively mutilated for size. The rise of TypeScript further marginalized the closure approach. Developers voted with their keyboards, choosing the ergonomic safety of TypeScript over the raw compression power of Clojure. The verbose JS doc comments required by Clojure, which cluttered the code and made it harder to read, could not compete with the elegant syntax of TypeScript. Despite this shift in public sentiment, the technical achievements of the Clojure compiler remain staggering. It introduced concepts that are now standard in every modern build tool. The idea of tree shaking, or dead code elimination, was perfected within Clojure. The compiler builds an abstract syntax tree, a map of the code's logic. It then traverses this map, identifying every function and variable that is defined but never used. Like a gardener pruning a dying branch, it severs these parts from the final output. In a massive application like Google Docs, where thousands of features exist but a user might only need 10, this capability is critical. It ensures that the user only downloads the code necessary for the features they are actually using. We must also consider the financial implications of this technology. The web is a medium of attention. By reducing the time it takes for a page to become interactive, the Clojure compiler directly influenced the stickiness of Google's products. In the attention economy, milliseconds translate into billions of dollars. When a user opens Gmail, and it loads in two seconds instead of five, they are less likely to abandon the task. Over billions of users and trillions of sessions, this retention effect generates vast sums of ad revenue and data acquisition. The compiler was not just a piece of code, it was a capital asset that generated a return on investment that rivaled the most successful financial instruments.
As the years progressed, the two parallel universes of Clojure and TypeScript began to collide. The Angular team at Google, responsible for one of the world's most popular web frameworks, found themselves caught in the middle. They wanted the developer ergonomics of TypeScript, but required the optimization power of Clojure. This led to a complex engineering synthesis. They built tools like TickSickle, a bridge that translated TypeScript code into the JS doc annotated JavaScript that Clojure could understand. This allowed Google to have it both ways. They could write in the modern, elegant syntax of Microsoft's language, then transpile it down to the raw material that their compiler could crush into dust. It was a marriage of convenience, proving that even rival philosophies must eventually compromise in the face of engineering reality. The legacy of the Clojure compiler extends beyond the walls of Google. It is used by major organizations that prioritize performance above all else. The relentless pursuit of optimization that it embodies has seeped into the DNA of the web. Tools that we use today, from Rollup to Tursa, owe a debt to the techniques pioneered by the Clojure team. They proved that JavaScript could be treated as a serious engineering discipline, capable of supporting applications that rivaled native desktop software. Before Clojure, the idea of a full word processor or a detailed 3D map running in a browser was laughable. After Clojure, it was the standard. There is a lesson here about the nature of constraints. The Clojure compiler imposed severe constraints on the developer. It forbade certain patterns, demanded verbose annotations, and punished ambiguity with broken builds. Yet, it was precisely these constraints that liberated the application. By restricting the freedom of the programmer, the compiler granted freedom to the software. It allowed the software to travel faster, load lighter, and perform better. In a world that often fetishizes absolute freedom, the Clojure compiler stands as a testament to the power of discipline. It demonstrates that true power comes not from doing whatever one wants, but from submitting to a rigorous structure that channels energy toward a singular goal. Consider the human cost of this technology. Generations of engineers at Google and elsewhere spent years mastering the idiosyncrasies of this system. They learned to think like the compiler. They learned to see their code not as a narrative, but as a graph of dependencies and references. This mental shift is the hallmark of the senior engineer. It is the ability to look past the surface level of the syntax and understand the mechanical reality of the execution. The Clojure compiler forced this maturation process upon the industry. It demanded that we stop playing with scripts and start engineering systems. In the end, the Clojure compiler remains a titan of the web, even as it fades from the spotlight of the trendy developer ecosystem. It is the silent workhorse that powers the tools you use every day. When you check your email, when you navigate a new city, when you collaborate on a document in the cloud, you are benefiting from the ruthless efficiency of this machine. It operates in the background, stripping away the excess, renaming the variables and enforcing the rules. It is a reminder that in the world of technology, clarity and speed are not accidents. They are the result of a deliberate, calculated and often painful process of optimization. The Clojure compiler did not just make code smaller, it made the modern web possible. It conquered the chaos, and in doing so, it defined the era. The story of the Clojure compiler is not merely technical. It is a story of vision. It is about seeing the potential for order in a sea of entropy. While the world was content with the slow and the bloated, a small group of engineers decided that they could bend the reality of the browser to their will. They succeeded, and in their success, they reshaped the digital world. The code they wrote is running right now, on your device, invisible and efficient, a ghost in the machine that ensures the world keeps spinning at the speed of thought. The parallel universe it created may be obscure to the uninitiated, but for those who know, it is the bedrock upon which the Cathedral of the Cloud was built.